Hey, what is going on, you guys? Welcome to One of Each, the Dumb and Hungry podcast, where we talk about our food adventures and our favorite food groups. I'm Angelo, the Dumb and Hungry. And I'm Macho. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're doing all right. Macho, do you know why I am feeling excited today? Because the Dodger season started? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly why. I mean, you're always wearing a hat. I assume I'm, you're a huge fan. I'm always wearing this LA hat, representing proud of my boys in blue. Uh huh. That's, uh-huh. that's how you say it, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. So you, you well, catch any of the games? Yeah, there's that uh, Otani, right? <laughs> and that uh, and the gambling. You know, that's uh, <laughs> it's very relevant. Yeah, the ra- oh, look. To talk about it more, let's bring in a couple of our correspondents here, our colleagues, if you will, bring them back. Uh, let's welcome back John and Daniel. Hey, guys, how you doing? Good. Also super excited for the Dodgers, right? Yes. <laughs> you see, look at that. You see? Um, so- also, this is an episode about food, not about the Dodgers. They did a short recently where uh, they asked all, all the players where their favorite restaurants in LA are. It's pretty interesting. There's one... I for- I forgot who called him out, but somebody got called out Alan Race. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, the manager said Girl and the Goat is his favorite, is his go-to spot. So, yeah, pretty interesting reel. Uh, if you share that with us, we'll share that with the uh, the rest of the world. And by the world, I mean no one. Our, our few and only fans. Us. Absolutely. Hmm. So, um, that'd be good. Uh, in the meantime, yeah, again, John and Daniel, hope you're doing okay. Uh, last time we talked, uh, we were sharing about our... Uh, I don't know our exotic meal at Poltergeist, um, and we were uh, we had a good uh, good meal there, and I'm sure a lot has happened since, but I don't know what. But let me uh, let me start with John. Actually, John, what's going on with you? Nothing. Moving on. Great. <laughs> <laughs> That's this is quality programming, people. When when was Poltergeist? Can you remind me? Some time ago. It was quite a while ago. Was it 2023 or prior? 2020, late 2023. Late 23. What's yeah. happened since late 23? A lot, mm. actually. A lot has happened since late 23. A few friends had babies. Um, a lot of Disneyland trips. And then there was a Mexico City trip sprinkled in there. Mm. Okay, good. Well, we'll get into that a little bit, but um, those are the highlights there. The babies? I hope not. <laughs> not, not what Nothing. people came for today. They came for the doctor. <laughs> not today. <laughs> they came for the sports play by play stat breakdown. Who done it and how did he do it? Um, all right. Well, how about you, Daniel? What's going on with you? Um, nothing huge. We uh the company I work for kinda had some some big milestones, some games released, which is cool. Um, I think since we last talked, but uh was it? I think probably a big highlight for the last few months was watching Dune 2. That movie was so, so dope. Big, big fan. Um, pretty much, it's just you put a really giant worm on a really giant screen with really giant speakers, and it's a great time. It's, it's a pretty simple movie formula, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, uh, do you have to watch uh, Dune 1 to appreciate the... Uh... The sequel, the continuation, if it is. Yeah, it's you definitely don't want to skip there. There is no like, let's try to ease the audience in. It's pretty much like right where Dune One left is where Dune Two starts. So mm-hmm. they kind of assume that you've you're you're with the program. Got it. Is um is Dune a delicacy as well? Can you like you know you summon these uh and then you. No. To be honest, I don't know if they had any things of food in the movie. If they, I don't, I don't want to know what food they ate actually in the desert. It seems like it'd be pretty rough. I mean, the worms just ate people. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you've seen this movie, Angelo, but this question seems like you have no idea what these worms do. <laughs> they have a popcorn uh, bucket. That that's that's the ticket right there. The popcorn bucket. Is that the money maker? That's the true money maker? No, it was the meme maker. It was the internet blew up because they released a promotional popcorn bucket to promote the movie. Mm-hmm. And it's basically just the popcorn bucket, but they put on top of it a plastic mold 
of the worm, which is basically just a giant vacuum with bristles. <laughs> and you have to reach into this bristled bucket to reach your popcorn. And then as you pull your hand out, you have to fight the bristles because they're going to fight you back for the popcorn. I'm waiting for that to be the new thing in movies. Like every movie gets a theme popcorn bucket. So like, <laughs> I don't know. Like Star Wars re-release gets like the Darth Maul bucket with like his head spikes sticking out, or like Fast and Furious gets like you know like a family, family. bucket. I don't know. <laughs> it's four buckets glued together. It's family. <laughs> it's family sticks together. <laughs> or as you as you insert your hand in the bucket, you have Vin Diesel saying it's for family. You know, family or whatever. You know, every time you reach in. Yeah. Not distracting at all during a movie. <laughs> My child, what's going on with you? What's uh, What's been going on since we last uh, saw each other? Since last week, honestly? Um, I don't remember. Did I talk about... Uh, oh, I did. Uh, when Oli had a couple of friends over and there was the, the Moonbridge Donuts. Um, you did? Mm-hmm. Dang, I already talked about that. Other than that did, not did you finish those donuts? Week. Yeah, the next day. <laughs> I was surprised. I thought it'd be that uh, that very evening. But well, I mean, you gotta you gotta save some for others, right? But then when they leave, it's, it's all it's all mine. I see. I you see. guys already talk about that Thai Cambodian restaurant from a couple weeks ago, and how eating there was like eating there was like shopping for health services, <laughs> and that you had no idea what were you gonna pay until. The bill came out. We we did we did we. I'm we not in those words, words. <laughs> but that's a good way of putting it. That's why you're here. Bring some perspective into this uh, dining right. experience. You missed out the most critical part of that dining experience. What the healthcare? Not knowing how much you're paying going into it. Well, do they, know, we, do they we offer we insurance? Where they like you can pay fifty bucks up front, and that covers you whether you're like higher or lower. <laughs> You have to pay a deductible when you first get in, so then mm -hmm. you win escape, and then they build you after the meal for the remainder of your patient balance or customer balance, I guess. No, it was just this place where, you know how, like, the, for most restaurants, there's a mix of fixed pricing on the menu, and then there'll be, like, seafood or some protein where you have market price. Literally everything at this restaurant <laughs> was market price. Yeah? Papaya salad, market price. <laughs> Drinks market price. So they're they're literally like they're going to GW in the morning, looking at their bill and being like, "Well, that was like three dollars today." So right, that sounds right. Exactly. And no itemized receipt either. So it's no could be anything. But, drink could have been fifty only. bucks on its own. And cash only. Anyways, they're all symptoms of fraud. <laughs> yeah. Just like that book you're reading. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't think Daniel saw this, but Angelo went through this painstaking exercise of scouting other Cambodian and Thai restaurants, looking for equivalent dishes in the area, and finding what was the menu price at those respective places, and plotting it on a chart to compare against how much our place supposedly charged us, not adjusted for inflation from six years ago. This sounds like a very valuable exercise and something that we should be doing frequently. Yes. <laughs> this is the kind of conversations we need to have in our right. current days. Yes. Right. The CPI index is not good enough. We should develop our own and maintain it for specific <laughs> ethnic foods. But as for uh, as for me, you know, I am uh, continuing to just continue to eat, find more things to eat. And um, just wanted to share a few things uh, recently. Um, some places we've mentioned in, in the past and whatnot. Uh, one such place is uh, a pop-up called uh, Hamburgers Nice. They're out there in uh, in Long Beach, and they're making some good smash burgers out there. Um, you know, in they uh, serve out of a uh, a coffee spot or some some place called Good Time. And um, during uh, during their breakfast service, they um, serve out these uh, kind of breakfast smash burgers. Uh, and then during lunch or dinner, then they'll serve out kind of more dinner things. So I think my recent visit. Um, they were serving out, uh, burgers with the take of like kind of an in and out style smash. So, you know, you have a smash burger, but then kind of in that in and out style, particularly notably with like chopped chilies, you know, if you know the move, you get those. Um, and then some kind of animal style fries as well. Um, pretty nice combo. And, um, 
and obviously that didn't quench or quell my hunger. So I paid another visit to uh, to a brewery nearby, and there's a pop up there called um, Smoke and Salted Barbecue, and um, some of the things that were serving out there included a uh, actually a smash burger and uh, a kind of a also a smash style um, you know food, but using longanisa. I know you might be familiar with that uh, that sweet sausage. John is nodding his head as well. Um, the sweet. There's a whole song in high school. What can you re- can you remind us? I can't. You will lose the last two followers you had if I were to replay it for you. There's a song. You, Wait, what do you mean? There's a song in high if school. If you uh, if you find it, share it with us, and uh, we'll share it with uh, with the few and only. So, um, anyway. But it was a longanisa, but like in a smash patty, served with like a fried egg, you know, some things like that. Um, now moving on to um, K Town, I, I visited out there recently, and um, there's a, a Korean barbecue restaurant that uh, I tried out called Meat Love uh, Korean Barbecue, and uh, I don't know if anyone's been out there, but I think um, it sounds familiar. Yeah, uh, it as far as uh, value to quality, I think. I think this is a strong contender of getting a, a great meal. So there are two tiers that I'm aware of, you know, as far as the types of meat you can get. And the, um, you know, the lower tier is only like $26, $27 versus the top tier, which is like $32. Um, but even with, uh, you know, that first tier, you get you get a pretty good amount uh, of, of, um, of meats to choose from. I think notably for me, for some reason, I'm looking for a, a good rib finger. And, um, you know, they, and the quality of that and all the other meats, the brisket, you know, the, they have a nice garlic, uh, um, pork belly as well. Um, and they also have, you know, for their sides, they have a, um, this kimchi rice lunchbox. I don't know you guys ever had that either on its own, or I don't know if any other place is serving it like this. Um, but it's, uh, you know. It's just think of a tin, a rectangular tin uh, filled with kimchi rice, you know, just uh, as the name says. Uh, and then what you do is that you actually shake the shake the box and, uh, you know, to mix it up and whatever. So it's kind of this nice comfort food to have along with uh, with all the key barbecue you're uh, enjoying as well. Um, and then um, one other thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, back to uh, Smash Burgers. Uh, John, I know you mentioned at one point you, uh, you know, you had caught your attention with uh, this place uh, for the win. And, um, you know, I had, uh, I was in the area and I decided to, you know, pay a visit there. Uh, well, revisit. I think I visited uh, sometime before, but um, it's, uh, it's a good spot. I mean, you know, it's a solid spot. Great smash burger. Um, I don't know what else to say. You know, it's interesting. I thought I, thought I had come across someone saying like, if you... Um, it's like all the, their take is like all smash burgers taste the same. Like if you have your favorite smash burgers, like I already know what it tastes like because they're all they're all the same. Uh, I don't know if that uh, holds true necessarily, but uh, I'm sure if it's good. It's, so it's, I've uh, been I've, I've had a similar theory or not theory, but like I guess a like a personal issue, which is. I try to go to all these hot LA burger places and they're all good burgers, but I haven't had a shitty burger in a long time. (laughs) It's like, I wonder now I'm like, you know, you start to have these and you're like, this is good. This is good. This is good. And I'm like, are these all good? Or like, are they all actually average? And I just haven't had like a bad burger in a while. I don't know. I feel like I need to just go get some McDonald's again and recalibrate. I feel like that's what's missing from my, my <laughs> well, you know, even then with experience. McDonald's, if in particularly like, you know, they, they are moving away as far as, uh, you know, the, uh, supposedly like lower, lower price market. Right. So they're like trying to up their game, their quality and whatnot. Not, not sure what that really means or what that translates to. So I, I don't know. If you know where that sets the if that sets the standard any longer, or you know what what is considered a a low quality burger these days, are they upping their game or are they just upping their prices? Just That's the true. prices, honestly. A, basically, the prices. I know the prices are going up. I haven't heard anything about the burgers becoming better quality. Yeah. <laughs> no well, way. I mean, you know, if you take um, there's some you know some of the the news you know of them announcing. Uh, you know, like uh, their changes to like the Big Mac, for example. You know, they were planning to 
Um, yeah, just look that up. I don't know. Look, I'm just saying. Um, well, I guess. Oh, yeah. The, the lesson is, if I want to find a shitty burger with which to judge the good burgers against, it's mm-hmm. not McDonald's anymore. I need to go find somewhere. Um, hope, yeah, generally, you know, they'll do it right. They'll they'll smash it thin, they'll get a nice crispy edge, you know. And then as far as what you're saying, some of these add-ons on there. I mean, traditionally, you know, a smash burger, um, you know, my show, we've talked about this before, you know, can be can be pretty plain. I mean, it, it doesn't have to have much on there. You know, you just have your meat, cheese, and bun. I mean, that's as basic as you get. If you want to add other things, it's typically like onions or pickles or something. Um, condiment wise, otherwise, you know, you're not even really putting, uh, things like ketchup on there. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different takes, a lot of different styles on the smash burger, especially here in LA now. Um, whether it's with the sauce or other toppings as well for the win, as far as their add-ons, they offer, for example, like bacon and jalapenos or whatever. You just add that on there. Um, but otherwise, yeah, they do have a, a sauce as well. Um, and I think with them, their bun, they use a potato bun, but they, they seem to toast it a little more because, you know, from my experience with, uh, smash burgers that offer potato buns, they're lightly toasted, you know, but more or less, they're just really kind of plushy, almost gummy. Not, not saying that in a bad way. That's just the texture you get from a potato bun. But, uh, in this case, it's just, um, it's just more toasted. So I think it just kind of has a little bit more structure, holds up a little more, uh, to, uh, the overall burger. So yeah. Um, may- maybe we'll have to kind of do another, take another, some time to compare or whatever and, uh, see what else is out there. I don't know. I think, you know, that the burgers are starting to taste the same when you have to differentiate them by how long they toasted their buns for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Anyway, um, speaking of food, <laughs> Uh, let's continue to talk about that. I want to thank you guys and also thank our our listeners, really our few and only fans for joining us as we uh, talk about some of our food adventures, these local spots, pop ups, you know, things in between with uh, good food and good people. Uh, I wanted to follow up on a couple of things here um, from some previous episodes, um, really the a previous episode we've done. Maicha, we uh, covered... Uh, really now that since it's been really, we probably covered about what, maybe close to 90 places, almost 90 places you could like eat in LA. And, uh, we've conquered various areas in the Los Angeles region, uh, from central LA to the San Gabriel Valley, the South Bay, you know, um, and all areas in between. Uh, but just a few items of, uh, you know, errata, I guess. Um, there was a, in a city I was, uh, I was mentioning, uh, the city of Bellflower mm-hmm. where, uh, I had listed a, a few restaurants in there. There was, uh, a taco, uh, taco restaurant and then, um, and then a, uh, orchata, uh, spot that also oh, has right. a, um, a sandwich spot in there, birote, uh, birote. Um, those two, the orchata spot and, uh, uh, the sandwich spot, they're actually in uh, in Paramount, so uh, they're not in Bellflower. So, again, not that anyone listens or cares to correct, but just to kind of set that straight, I've updated the uh, the notes as well. Um, but uh, just letting people know that, and then also the Orchata place, I I refer to as Orchateria, which is incomplete. The uh, full name of that restaurant is uh, Orchateria Rio Luna. Um, again. Not that anyone cares or that anyone's keeping track, but uh, now you guys know. Um, and then lastly, uh, we were talking about this earlier about our uh, our visit to um, you know to Long Beach in uh, in Cambodia town. Um, but uh, I had referred to that uh, neighborhood as Little Cambodia, which again is uh, not accurate. It is no. in fact called uh, Cambodia Town. So. Mm. Um, Moving on to uh, kind of the main stuff of today, uh, we brought uh, John and Daniel here, uh, probably to much of their regret uh, and reluctance, to kind of um, talk about a couple things. Uh, the first of which, uh, about a trip that they've recently taken, and so I wanted to kind of let them uh, share about uh, about that and a lot of the food stuff, maybe some non-food stuff, but mostly food stuff, um, about that. So... 
Uh, John, I'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what I'm talking about here? Uh, about Mexico City. That's In terms of what we ate? That would be preferred. So, a lot we of the stuff that you can find... Out. Was that there? Did, do we do anything else in Mexico City? It's our, what I'm, what I'm no, trying to say, like, that was pretty much it. <laughs> That's correct. We traveled strictly to eat. We found mm-hmm. activities to do, mostly by happenstance. Some of them was research. Two, the two things are researched. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, but the rest of it was food. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean the food scene. There's a lot of there's a lot of proper restaurants, fine dining. There's also a lot of street food, so you can kind of get the whole gambit. It's not too different from LA in terms of the kinds of things that you can find. Um, we ate a lot of tacos and tostadas. And a ton of churros, although we didn't really diversify. I really went to two places. One of them was preferred over the other. Um, had a few horchatas, uh, some quesadillas. Kind of the stuff that, again, you would find in L.A., but just different preparations or different inspirations or just different stories behind them. Why don't you give us a few examples, either you or Dan, give us a few examples of those places. Drop some names and, you know, give us examples of uh, what you would get from there. Fire away, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, I got I to gotta bring up this, like, spreadsheet that you guys <laughs> made, all, all, all the accounts, putting all their restaurants in a Google spreadsheet. Well, um, and a Google map. Let's see. Yeah, Mexico City 2024 spreadsheet. All right, what do we got? We got um, Tostadas Coyacan. So that's a tostada place. Um, we've got um, Taqueria El Purix. Those were, um, that was a taco stand. We've got Lardo Breakfast Place. Um, Taqueria Orinoco, another taco stand. This one's um, specializing in El Pastor. Um, we got um, churros were um, El Moro. So that was our, our number one churro place, which fortunately has a, a spot in San Juan Capistrano, I think, now, too, or somewhere in the OC. So um, don't have to fly to Mexico City just for that anymore. Um, we got, I don't know. All right. So there's some places that aren't in the spreadsheet, so I'm, I'm in trouble now. But basically... <laughs> A lot of, lot of options. <laughs> Good. So where um, in the city? I mean, I don't know. I don't really know the scale. I mean, how, you know, how far did you kind of venture off within this, you know, in the city or, or otherwise? Um, so good question. So the city is huge um, in terms of like where people actually live. Um, you know, we one of the people we talked to basically said there's a lot of people who drive in like two hours from the outskirts of the city to get into work so city itself is massive but in terms of places that are good for turks there's really just like three you know maybe four neighborhoods um and those those i'd say are like each one has like walkable sections but then to get to each one you're probably going to want to drive that being said the ubers are so dirt cheap that you never really like you don't have to overly plan and be responsible you're like oh let's try to do this it's like Oh, it's three dollars to Uber over there! Yay! Like it's the blood thing of living and making American dollars. <laughs> yeah, it goes farther. Um, so, from all the places that you had mentioned so far that you can recall from because of the spreadsheet, which which of those would you say stood out and and why? Um, I guess I guess I, I have a few standouts in different categories. Um, Go ahead. Most alarming and and disappointing, maybe to get that out of the way first. We mm-hmm. we got we went to an what we thought was an elote stand because we're like <laughs> we, we like elote, like we like Mexican street corn, like this is good. Um, and you know we we tried to do the responsible thing of you know they're like, do you want lot? Yeah, do you want like salsa? Like yeah, like do you want you like put it all in? Like anything you ask, like just put it in. By the time we got it, we're all like, yeah, no, this is terrible. Um, just did not, did not work. Um, so the additional context behind that was we went to the wrong elote lady 
it turns out there's many elote ladies throughout Mexico City. They're at the little neighborhood we were in, which is right by Frida Kahlo's house. Um, so we thought we had found the place that we had researched, but as soon as we walked to the next street corner, there were more vendors. And the next street corner, there were more vendors. So we suspect we did not get the right one. Yeah. Uh, so, there are there works. are plenty. Uh huh. I don't think there's any shortage of um, you know, Eloteros and, and otherwise over there. So Yeah, so that that's the one I'll just say. Like that was that was the only thing I think we ate that whole trip where I was like, nope, like I'm I'm not eating like I'm not finishing this. Like I had my like four bites and I'm good. No um, so so remind me, were were you saying that that spot did not serve like elote like as you expected or it just didn't or it did it just wasn't at like the level that you expected expected at all i think both like mm -hmm. a it wasn't quite the dish we had in mind like okay compared, compared to eating similar stuff in la yeah. and then b like there's probably a way that dish could be really good but it wasn't there <laughs> okay all right so we got that out of the way what are the more um more notable spots there yeah i think um the one you know, I'll say like kind of nice dining, you know, that this was, you know, we kind of sat down, dressed up, like paid, I think what it ended up being like forty dollars US a person. So which which for Mexico City was was decently expensive. Um uh, restaurant called Contramar. That was delicious. Um uh, maybe we can talk about that one more later because that, that kind of goes into the next restaurant. I know you want to talk about at some point, Angelo. Um but that was a really good seafood, seafood restaurant, delicious. Good. Uh, John, what about any standouts for you? So Contramar would be my number one standout as well. The other place that I always think about is a place called Jenny's Quesadilla. And it's just this woman on the street vending um, quesadillas, blue corn, handmade quesadillas. And the reason why it sticks out to me is because so many TripAdvisor reviews said that she would be mean if you did not speak to her in Spanish. And if you um, were, and if you didn't ask, say please or say thank you, she'd be really rude. And so I was the one tasked with ordering everything. And I remember just being on edge talking to this woman. I'm like, please don't let my Spanish go bad now. Not that it was great to begin with, but don't let this go sideways where she ends up serving us something other than what we asked for. Um, but she ended up being perfectly nice and very pleasant. And yeah, she was busy and. Uh, I think they start cooking there really early and they cook till they sell out. We got there around 4 p.m. Um, but, you know, all the stuff that we wanted, she had sold out. But we tried some other things and they were all really good. She was nice and worked out great. I think what was unique about Mexico City that I haven't seen too much of is for a lot of these street vendors, you get your food, you eat it. And then when you return the tray, that's when you pay for it. Mm -hmm. Whereas... I'm used to, for a street vendor, you give them your money, they hand you the food, and then you're off and do your own thing. So it was that was pretty common practice for a lot of the street vendors that we went to. Um, the other one that stands out is a Chilaquiles place. Uh, that was on a street corner. What's yeah, I forget what it's called. Something Chilaquiles, and it has the word for corner. La Esquina? La Esquina. Mm -hmm. La Esquina. Um, and it's literally a street corner where um, yeah. they sling chilaquiles tortas. La esquina de chilaquil. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Nice. It's literally the corner of chilaquil. <laughs> um, but they make a chilaquiles torta, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a bunch of fried tortillas and a green chilaquiles with chicken in it. Um and there's some other spread and sauces in there. They put it in a hollowed out porta um, and they wrap it all, twist it up in a little plastic bag, and that's it. And they give you some napkins. Super simple, like $2 or something nice. for breakfast chilaquiles. And that was very unique. Never had a chilaquiles in a sandwich before, but it worked really well. Super delicious. Yeah. Pro tip if you go there, there is a woman who is hollowing out the torta bread. Mm -hmm. And she's scooping out the insides into a bin. That bin is now a trash can. That's all <laughs> I have to say. Uh huh. Uh huh. Context. That is all. That is all. Okay. 
Less than you love that. I see. Just a couple. That's right. Just a couple ignorant Americans watching that. (laughs) Yeah, I I will say like, I mean, the stuff we're talking about. It's interesting that these are the highlights because these were kind of like the one-offs. Like you know, this was the like the one Chila Chila torta we had, or you know, like Jenny's kids deal. We like the stuff we had a ton of was was really just like tacos. Like we had probably like four different or like two to four different taco places per day almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and they they were all really good, but it's just interesting that the ones that stand out were like the not tacos. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of El Paso tacos. We did visit a bakery. Uh, actually, no, we stopped by two bakeries um, in in central in downtown. Like I guess their downtown area. Um, it's just like imagine it's like a Porto's except unstructured. So actually, sorry, it's like a eighty nine degrees except enormous. So you kind of just walk around this massive complex, and there's pastries on every wall, and then every shelf has pastries. And then there's a bunch of counters in the center and those have pastries. And then the, um, you know, the trays that you get at 89 degrees in lieu of a tray, you get this huge metal sheet that you use to put your pastries on top of (laughs) solid metal sheet. Yep. And there's like people of all walks of life, of all ages in there carrying all these pastries. And you're just like, man, the upper body strength of some of these people is impressive. Yeah, they, they take that dessert cool between between like the bakeries, the churros, the hot chocolates, uh, ice cream, fruits, like drinks. Like they they have a lot of they have a lot of sweets. But yeah, I mean, I think I think part of it is like just the culture of like you know whenever they meet up for for events, they they bring a ton of people, so they're gonna bring a ton of pastries, and works for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's kind of like what you said earlier, Daniel. Like everything when you were talking about eating burgers and smash burgers and how there's all been quality things that they all you can't really tell if there's anything necessarily bad in there. They kind of have the same standard. And that's kind of how I felt with a lot of the places I went to because all the tacos are good. The quesadillas are good. Um, other than the elote place, like everything was delicious. Like they all started to kind of blend together. You know, it's the same basic ingredients of some kind of flour or some kind of corn based tortilla, some protein, something acidic like a salsa something fatty like a crema and they all were kind of just different building blocks different ways of putting it together but they all came together really well and they all balanced really well they're all really tasty it's just hard to think of like the unique things were the thing or the things that are standing out are the really unique things are just very different from everything else we ate that's not to discount everything else we ate it was all delicious we just ate way too much to be able to recount at all we had a taco crawl one day and i think I can't remember how many tacos we ate. It was like six or seven. I think we went to five places in just three hours, four hours, maybe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was a lot. We had a lot. It was all delicious. And um, how how long did you guys, uh, you know, stay? You know, how long was your visit? I was it? Like, we got there. Was it Thursday we landed and then left on... Tuesday, I want to say so. Yeah. Four four full days and then two travel days on each end. Do you uh, do you think that was enough time to be able to visit what you wanted and you know, uh, yeah, and appreciate you know all the things that you you had over there? I I personally thought that was like the exact right amount of time. I think I think it was like the night before was the night where I was like I've I've like hit the wall on the food and kind of out of other things to do so like yeah going home tomorrow morning sounds like a good idea (laughs) Um, yeah were there more restaurants we could have tried absolutely do we hit everything on our list not even close but by that last day you're kind of just like stay with daniel just like yeah i think i'm good i'm ready to go back home and detox for a while Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah nice um, so you guys mentioned, uh, a, a restaurant that was a uh, Contramar. Um, yeah, I did want to kind of get a little into that a little more, um, about your take on, on the experience and things there. Cause like you said, Daniel kind of lead us to, um, you know, some of the other things we wanted to talk about, but, um, yeah, tell us about that meal and, um, what people can expect or look forward to if visiting there. 
So the vibe of the restaurants, um, it's it's in a pretty bougie upscale part of town. So like if you if you walk in there, you're you're gonna think you're walking into any other hip LA high ceiling, you know, like busy place. It's it's like just one giant dining room. Um, you know, people people are talking. It's loud. The the wait staff are hustling though. Like I mean, they've got tons of wait staff and they're just going like up and down. I mean, the place is super popping. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you could totally think like you were, you know, you were in LA. Um, and then the food is not, not to steal maybe John Sunday there, but like, cause he, he was the big proponent of order as much on the menu as possible. Um, but the food was, was delicious. It was a good call. Very, very seafood based, but delicious. That same attitude was why we got so tired of Mexico city too. So quickly. Oh man. Oh, John's fault. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but it was good for this restaurant. Okay, so tell me about some of the things that, you know, you would get there. Or that you would have someone get there if they... So their most famous item is a tuna tostada. Um, I guess maybe famous being like, this is the one that, you know, if you go on TripAdvisor or wherever, or Google reviews, this is the one everyone's like, got to get the tuna tostada. Is, uh, um, does it look like this? That is exactly what it looks like. Good, good pie, okay. good pull up. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty much people are right on the money. Like you could go in and order just those, and I'd be happy. For me, it's like the exact flavor I want from a tuna tostada. Like it's the tuna is super fresh. Um, had like a ponzu sauce on there, like so it was you know a little bit citrusy avocado the tostada itself was really nice and crispy so there wasn't um you know i don't think there was anything in there that was particularly like like oh wow i've, I've never had this before or this is like such a surprise but it was just it was like in my head exactly what i think of when i wanted to know tostada and just really really good mm. do you agree john yes nice um any other um, there? Well, this, so I was going to say on that tostada, kind of like what Daniel said, it's just everything works together so well. Like, especially if you look at the picture, it looks pretty simple. Um, the tuna is cut in in sheets. It looks like sheets. They're not cubed or anything, so it's not a ceviche style cut. Um, it's almost like a a sashimi that you forgot to slice down the middle the long way, and you just kind of yeah. just placed it onto this tostada. Yeah. Um, and everything just works really, really well together. It's citrusy, it's fatty. The fish itself is super fresh, super buttery. Mm. Um, it just it just comes together really well. You get all the textures, crunchy, creamy, fatty. Uh, you get all the flavors, savory, sweetness, citrusy. I don't know. It's just, it's perfect. It's really simple, but it's it was amazing. And, and then uh, you were asking about other dishes. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was saying for that uh, particular dish, what would be the equivalent, uh, you know, U.S. price? The equivalent U.S. price, like what did it convert to? Yeah. Uh, don't remember how much it was on you. Does the spreadsheet? Is that not? <laughs> is that not in your slide deck you had pulled up, Angelo? Uh, it's not my slide deck. I mean, you know, Daniel has the spreadsheet. Yeah, but didn't you just have a roll of itinerary, not the uh, not the bill? Uh, Correct. <laughs> well, we'll look that up and uh, we'll follow up with that. But go ahead, John. What what other things did you want to highlight there? Uh, something else that we had that was delicious was the octopus, and oh, I don't so really remember. So good, as delicious yeah. octopus. I don't remember how. It was, I mean, it was grilled and fired. It had a, a bit of a char on it, but. I don't remember what it was called on the menu or there's a specific mm -hmm. name for the dish. Yeah. It's just the octopus itself, which is super tender, super buttery. You know, sometimes you get octopus and it fights back as you try to eat it. This one is just submissive <laughs> and you can just tear through it. Um, Got it. It was perfectly cooked. Uh, the char added a nice flavor to it and it came with a sauce that was a bit of sweetness, savory. Again, I can't remember what any of the things were called, but it was a definite standout. Yeah. Definitely so I'm standout. giving you as non-specific descriptions as I can because that's all I can remember. Absolutely. But that's that's all. Check I out Contramar. Check out the octopus dish. 
Okay. Ours did not look like that. This one looks a little fresh in that they didn't cut anything, but uh -huh. I can guarantee you they cut it into much more manageable pieces than this. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, that, that one looks like they literally just put it from the bay on the plate, but ours <laughs> a little more. Right. Yes. Yes. That looks a little bit more like C to table concept. Ours was C to kitchen to table. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Okay. Good. Um, do you, do you think that there are, um, you know, a lot of similar restaurants like this, um, as far as the quality or anything, uh, first in, you know, Mexico city, are there similar types of restaurants out there that you would have also considered, uh, visiting if you had the chance or was it just Contramar like that's, that's for seafood it. or you mean it just in general, I think for this type of restaurant. Yeah. Like, so it's seafood. I think at this price point, there's a lot of just a lot of restaurants in Mexico City in in those like more touristy neighborhoods um, mm -hmm. that you know people coming from the U.S. are probably going to stay in. Like, there's a ton of these kinds of like, you know, by probably Mexico City standards, like high end restaurants, but it comes out to maybe like you know forty, fifty USD a person. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's a lot of restaurants at that price point. We we heard about Contrabar from from friends and the internet, so so like that was one of our priorities to go there. And I, I could say they were absolutely right. Like it was delicious. Um, but we, I mean, we focused a lot on like street food on our trip. This was kind of our, our one, like, nice, you know, sit down place to go to. But I, I have, I think you could kind of reverse it almost and like do a trip to Mexico city where you're just trying out these sorts of restaurants and you could totally make a trip out of it. There's a ton. Mm. Good to know. So now that you've uh, you had your taste of Mexico City, um, let's say with street food, would you say that you would, uh, how would you compare that scene to what we have here in, in L.A.? Good question. Um, I think L.A. we're fortunate enough to have, like, we, I mean, we're pretty close to the border, so, like, you know, we definitely have pretty solid Mexican food, and we have you know, there's a lot of taco spots you can go to and, and enjoy it and get really good food. I think the, to me, the main difference is, is yeah, probably just the small things like the variety. Like, you know, we, we have a certain amount of taco places. And then because of that, there's a certain amount of like, oh, these are the really good taco places. Whereas in Mexico City, it felt a little more like, oh, I could literally just walk like two more blocks and boom, there's another really good taco place. Mm -hmm. Versus LA where I have to put in a little more effort to be like, oh, that's the good one everyone's talking about. I see. Um, Interesting. So you felt uh, in in the areas you know that you were visiting there. Yeah, it was very uh, like accessible. Uh, much more. Yeah, there's just a lot more that's just easily reachable and uh, you know to go to. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then price price is like the big winner. It's mm -hmm. Just just going to eat at these places and walking like like you do your taco crawl and you're like. Oh, we spent like twenty dollars to eat at five places. Like, oh, okay, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a that sounds like a good time. Um, John, you had any other thoughts on that? Um, I would say kind of along the same lines as Daniel is just abundance. So there are a lot of great places in LA, but you do have to get in your car and to go visit them and seek them out. Whereas in Mexico City, street vending is a very common um, uh, practice, and you don't have to walk very far to try the next great thing. And that's was kind of the cool experience about it was literally you could put the crawl in taco crawl because you're just walking mm -hmm. from place to place. Obviously, we didn't necessarily do all that much walking because we had a, a list of things that we wanted to try. So we ended up catching Ubers to go from place to place. But you can see plenty of vendors everywhere you went, um, especially in certain parts of town, like Oro Manor, uh, Oro Manorte um, had a lot of street vendors. The area that we were staying in was kind of like the Beverly Hills of Mexico City was what it was described to me afterwards when I told people we stay there. Um, so a lot of restaurants, they were just more sit down restaurants. Uh, but again, if you explore into the broader city, there's just abundance in, of vendors and it's just a matter of picking and choosing and everything was delicious. Um, I found the price of the tostada. Okay. So for four pieces, it's 345 pesos. And I believe the conversion was 17 to one. 
Yeah. So it works out to be about twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. Yeah. For four pieces, so five dollars a piece. But again, this was a little quote unquote higher end, and it was because um, you can get tacos for like as low as like thirty cents. Um, so this is a sit down restaurant, but you know you pay for the quality. If this was in LA. Like a Bessie was doing this, it would not be twenty bucks for four of these. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking that. Like, I could easily see a restaurant in LA charging thirty or thirty-five for these. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. each, but yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not each. Or maybe if they were, it's probably not a restaurant I'm going to. But yeah. <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. Okay. Not naming yeah. any names, no boo, but yes, it's very possible. <laughs> uh, well, good to hear. Um, you guys have anything else to add about uh, Mexico City before we uh, move on? Uh, um, fun fact. Oh, go for it. The, uh, the Spanish word for tuna is just tuna backwards. Tuna. I'm sorry, no, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't do this right. <laughs> it's not tuna right. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, it's, not quite right. it's just a rearranging, a rearranging of the letters. Oh. Like, it's uh, atun. Never mind. Was, you know, that played like, out much better in my head. But then as soon as you said a nut, I was like, I really messed that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can't go wrong either way. My, my one thing I'll say about Mexico City is that, so, I mean, we talked about other food, but the, the unsung hero was really the churros. Like, I think in total, across, across the four days, we probably ordered like 40 different churros. Or like, like to eat between the four of us. So it's yeah, probably like ten churros a person by the time we left. Um, and I have no regrets about that. That was fantastic. That was delicious. Nice. And they're so so cheap compared to like Disneyland churros. Um, so yeah, definitely go to Mexico City. It may be like a touristy thing to eat the churros, but goddamn, they're good. And uh, do you eat the churros on their own, or do you have it with that uh, chocolate sauce as well? You can get it with the chocolate sauce, um, or like even like hot chocolate they sell it with. But to be honest, just just plain was just mm -hmm. good. All right, good to know. Um, well, thanks for sharing about that. You know, we uh, I'm sure our um, our listeners would be very eager to visit uh, Mexico City and try out all the the good eats there. Um, you know, speaking of which, uh, it kind of brings us to kind of the other main thing we wanted to talk about. Um, you know, you had uh, we talked about the uh, the restaurant Contramar as far as being a seafood restaurant. And that kind of reminded me that we wanted to kind of talk about a, a, a meal that we had recently and um, kind of share a little bit about our thoughts on that. And um, that restaurant is a whole Bosch. And uh, that will be the official pronunciation of this restaurant. But I guess however you decide to pronounce is is on you. But uh, I just want to set that straight for um, for the few. Do they have an official pronunciation guide out there for this? I'm not sure about the guide, but, you know, and just uh, looking up on, you know, on videos and stuff about, uh, you know, that highlight the restaurant. Uh, that's the, that's how I hear it uh, pronounced. So. Uh, that's what I'm going to go with. Oh, so. okay. So there's there's an island in Mexico with the same name, that's and right. it is pronounced Holbosch. Okay, all right. That that's what it's named after. You're right. Yes. Yeah. So okay. Um. Uh. But you know, however you pronounce as we go along, again, that's that's on you. Um. So, uh, Holbosch is a um is a is a restaurant that that serves uh. You know, high quality seafood, very thoughtful preparation on that. Their uh, their restaurant here in LA, in um, I guess would be really the what would that area be? Kind of Exposition Park. Yeah, um, I was gonna say. Oh. You know, it's uh, near USC. Um, so, you know, depending on you know where you're coming from, it it could be accessible. It could be uh, a way away, mm -hmm. a ways away. I don't know, but uh, some people may not all may think also it may not be. Um, I don't know the, the one of the most reputable areas necessarily, but um, if you find your way out there, you would uh, want to make your way to the uh, Mercado Mercado La Paloma, and um, it's uh, that is a food hall that you will find a variety of restaurants, including uh, Whole Bosch. Um, you know, it's um, it's a restaurant that's received a lot of acclaim. Um, 
recently and in the last few years. I think they started, I think, 2016, 17. And um, since then, they've they've uh, received a lot of uh, nods from uh, Michelin Guides. I think last year they received LA Times Restaurant of the Year. Um, but, uh, but again, I think it just speaks to, I think, the quality and... Uh, uh, the type of food I think that they're serving out of this out of this uh, this space. So um, I do want to also uh, shout out to Jamie since uh, you know I have her to thank for introducing us. I think my child we had uh, taken that trip out there. We were doing one of our one of the taco crawls with her, and she was showing yeah. us around to some of these spots, and this was one of them. Um, you know, uh, but uh, and so. Uh, times that I've visited since uh, I think I've told these guys I've always left impressed uh, usually because you know because of where you're at what you're paying for and what you're getting um, you know considering all those factors it's just uh, uh, something that uh, really does leave you impressed something that um, with just really good a really good meal um, so we wanted to kind of talk about the, um, uh, the dinner that we had um, this is particularly a tasting menu um, that they offer. And um, uh, John, make sure to thank Carmen for um, making that reservation. But um, she was uh, able to find a, a time for us to, to get out there. And um, uh, I think as far as cost and you know what what they're serving we'll get into that i thought it was a pretty pretty good value of um you know what you're getting for your meal so um let's before we get into the meal again i i did want to kind of start off uh that uh, there's a little little story at least from that that i'll that i'll appreciate but um uh i arrived there a little early you know sitting down there it was pretty busy you know you know it's it's a food hall so a lot of uh common spaces tables and whatnot um and uh i did kind of have a little celebrity sighting and celebrity as far as in the uh in the food and, and podcast space there's uh you know a podcast that that i listen to um and i'm sure many do as well called uh, air jordan and uh, the host there, Mr. Jordan Oaken, was uh, was out and about with uh, with his crew, and um, they were, I, I believe, they were also um, uh, enjoying, you know, uh, the tasting menu. But I think in different circumstances. Um, but uh, um, so I got to see it. But again, as celebrity sightings go, generally, I don't know what your thoughts are, but you know, you usually don't uh, you don't necessarily disturb uh celebrities um while, while they're in the wild or something um it's just not worth the time yeah um, i agree I, I usually more just kind of like you know whoever's next to me we talk excitedly and then for years after i can tell people be like oh my god i saw you know jason bateman at the movie theaters and so i'll forever have that memory that he has no knowledge of but to me it's a secret <laughs> thing <laughs> exactly and you know I, I know after their meal they were walking around the the market and you know the hall and uh yeah i mean sure enough you know their their party and and him they uh passed by where i was and i just kind of looked at them and you know i just had to smile because uh you know just a a nice sight just a good appreciation of uh the stuff that they're putting out there um so as then as far as the uh the meal goes it's a menu you know it's a tasting menu so the menu does change and does rotate but um let's talk about some of the things that um that we had. I do have some of the uh, some things we had. So uh, let's jog our memories and um, let's start off with uh, with this here. This was um, uh, the conchas, I believe, and uh, this had the uh, the oysters and the uh, the gooey duck. So uh, either you want to jump in and kind of just give me your thoughts on you know this dish here. I was gonna say I love I love oysters, so that was that was already like a great immediate win. Uh, gooey duck, it's it's not something that you get often, so it's it's usually kind of out of place. I'm like, okay, if they're making gooey duck, they probably have like a pretty good idea how to do it. And this was super light, super refreshing, um, really got me. And then yeah, I mean it was it was a really good start to the meal. Can you can either of you remind us on uh, what exactly gooey duck is? It looks almost like a heart, but in like seafood form. I don't know. Does that sound weird? 
It's very difficult to describe without changing the tune of this podcast. Um, uh, it's, it's not that different. Not far off. No. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a it's a sea creature that lives in a shell, but it's rather large. And I think I saw him shuck the whole thing out of the shell. So there's a. I think when the I don't know if this is a bivalve. Is that the right term for this? I think um, so. But this. Okay, so it's a bivalve creature, and I have no idea what that means. Um, but I think he ended up shucking the entire thing. So there's a portion of the of the creature that protrudes out of the shell, and I think that's the one that does all the feeding. And then there's the body itself that's in the shell. Uh, the chef took the entire thing out, and basically sashimi sliced everything up um, and threw it in like a citrus dressing. Um, mm-hmm. And like Daniel said, it was just very fresh, very soft. I think that's the theme of everything here, was it was just very fresh. Um and it just had a nice, pleasant texture. It took on the flavor of the sauce that was tossed in. I thought there was a yellowtail or something else that was in there. I can't remember what fish was mixed in there. Uh, but yeah, it was a nice way to start the meal. Very light, refreshing. Um, the oysters, the one on the left was from the West Coast. The one on the right was from the East Coast. They were both very tasty. Didn't have any ocean flavor that you might sometimes encounter when you have oysters. Uh, but everything worked really well together. Yeah, I uh, I agree. It's just a good light way to start off uh, what was what was to come. I um, wanted to also mention uh, that um, you know the the chef and, and owner uh, that that name is um, uh, Gilberto uh, Satina, and um, you know he's he uh, he works out of that space. And also another notable you know uh, restaurant in that in that hall is. Um, is Chichen Itza, and um, I uh, I believe it's his family that also kind of operates that space. Oh. So it's kind of nice to know that he keeps it all in the family, and uh, you know, just continue to grow, you know, over there. So um, very good. So let's. Uh, so that was how we started. Let's move on to this um, to this next dish, the uh, the crudo de uh, crudo de rocot. So. Um, I'm just reading off a copy of the menu here. It was a, a local line caught Ikejime vermilion rockfish with a grilled lemon vinaigrette. So, uh, Daniel, I think you were a little familiar more with the pro- the uh, technique of Ikejime. Can you like kind of explain a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Yeah, so it's um, what is this? It's a technique from Japan. So it came up when at some point I went to Japan and we we're watching like sushi videos. So that's, that's how I heard about it the first time. They'll have like a spike through the fish to like kill it ASAP. Um, and that way, like, I guess as it dies, the rigor mortis doesn't really set in. So that way it's a little more tender. Um, or what's it? Yeah. The fish meat is a little more tender, um, which hopefully makes it yummier. Um, but it's kind of a different preparation. And I guess they they did a lot of their fish that way. He was pretty proud of it. Um, but I'll say, yeah, that dish was delicious for for a fish that like you can see at ninety nine ranch, and you're like, I don't know about you guys, but when I see seafood at ninety nine ranch, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'll probably take that home, and like it'll be fine. But this was like, mm-hmm. oh shit, this is gourmet. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and really, uh, just really simple, you know, simple preparation, but uh, just brought out, you know, just this fish, this nice fish flavor, um, really well. Um, what do you think, John? Uh, not much else sad. I mean, it was, it was citrus and fresh fish, it was all, like ceviche, but it wasn't cured in the um, citrus. It was just a, a accompaniment, but very nice, very fresh, very light okay. flavor. Good. Uh, had some sweetness to it. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah, nice. So from there, um, we move on to uh, uh, this next this next item here, uh, the raspada de Einat. I mean, atun, John. Atun. <laughs> yeah. You gotta be careful how you say a nut because it sounds like something else. <laughs> no matter how you slice it. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not slicing, but depends um, on how many nuts you eat. Anyways. Yeah. Uh so this was a uh a Baja California bluefin tuna ceviche with a house made tostada raspada, avocado puree, and an arbol uh, peanut sauce. Um the sh- uh, chef uh, was uh, explaining the uh, the technique and process of preparing a tostada raspada, which is a tostada, but 
in which um, you know it's it's laid on the uh, on the grill on the heating element or uh, to cook on one side, right? But it doesn't uh, get flipped. In fact, the um, the uncooked you know portion of the masa is scraped off, and it creates a uh, a thinner you know product overall. Um, it's still it's light, but there's still a crunch to it, but kind of like a delicate crunch. Um, and so that's topped here with, you know, the, the tuna and, and all the other things we mentioned here. So, um, yeah, tell me, uh, what you think of what you thought about this dish. Delicious. You know, I think it's very deceiving, like how much effort goes into making that tostada. Cause I thought he had said after they scraped off that uncooked, um, masa, they let it cure or dehydrate for mm. 12 hours. Uh-huh. And then after that, they fried it. And so the texture of that tostada is almost like a rice cake. Like it's a really, really light, yeah, yeah. very fluffy, but also very crunchy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's got corn flavor to it because it is a, a masa. Um, but yeah, I mean, just like everything else we've been talking about, citrus, citrus notes, fresh tuna. They had a huge chunk of tuna that they were filleting and, and cutting in front of us. Uh, everything was being prepared in front of us. We're seated at a bar style seating uh, with glass. Um, I don't want to say window, like a, a glass um, uh, divider, if you will, a glass case. Maybe that's the best way to describe it. The glass case and behind it, that's where they're doing all their prep. So you can see everything that goes into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the tostada itself was definitely the most effort that was required to prepare this dish. Everything else was a matter of just preparing the fish fresh, putting in the citrus, putting in the seasonings, and then tossing it. Um, but the tuna was delicious. Uh, the avocado spread was great. And I don't know. It's just like another well balanced thing. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was impressive how, like, he spent. So like each dish, he he goes into all the details of like, you know, where did the fish come from? Who who fished it? Like all that and and after he spent a minute talking about that, I was like, okay, we got it. And then he spent like maybe three minutes talking about the tostada part. I was like, damn, all right, this tostada is really where I like the efforts. Yeah. Like, like this is no just casual tostada. Like it's like right. every single component took a lot of effort. Um, but yeah, I mean, when that. When that tostada came out in my head, like we just talked about, Contramar had an awesome tuna tostada. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, mm-hmm. fuck yeah, like this is, <laughs> this is where it's at. Like we're, we're getting down to business here. And this was different, but just as amazing. Yeah. Really, really good. Totally. Um, yeah, that's good to hear. Just kind of on a side note, you know, the, um, just because of the, uh, the Arbol peanut sauce, um, there's a lot of there are a few different, um, uh, you know, salsas and things that that they prepare at the restaurant that that are really good to try. Um, I think this is one of them, but there are other varieties as well, different uh, with different kind of intensities of heat, different just different uh, flavors um, that pair well with you know the different uh, items that they would get on the regular menu. Uh, I just thought I'd throw that out there. You know, just uh, whenever you see. Uh, Whenever you're there and you see, um, you know, a set of bottles with uh, the different uh, sauces, please make sure to uh, to try them. The um, now next uh, next up is this. Um, okay, let's see. I got ceviche de riso con jurel, and uh, this one I think we had a little fun with this actually. Uh, if you guys can recall, uh, this is uh, live Santa Barbara sea urchin. And a Baja California yellowtail ceviche in there, um, yeah that that was uh, that was an interesting one. But uh, go ahead, guys, talk about this. A plus presentation. I'll just, I'll, yeah. I'll say that. Um, it was definitely some some were a little uh, more excited than others. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, very. Oh, well, I shouldn't be the one that follow ups uh, on that comment because they're associated me with that commentary, but he's referring to the urchin itself. Um, so the, I mean, just like everything else is prepared in front of you. So he's got this huge bin of the urchin that they take out of the fridge. And he's got this device that looks like it's built to split sea urchins open. And so it goes into the center of the sea urchin, it splits them in half. 
And then you can watch the chef go through each urchin and pick out all of the uh, of the innards of the urchins, as well as removing all the stuff that you're not supposed to eat or maybe aren't very pleasant to eat. Um, they mix a ceviche to go with it. That goes into the urchin, and then it's topped with the actual sea urchin itself. Um, and because it's so fresh, um, some of our sea urchins were still... Uh, doing some waves of their their spines during the entirety of the meal. If you weren't paying attention, you would not have noticed, but they were they were definitely still moving uh, as you ate them from the inside. This mm-hmm. is starting to sound very wrong, but yes, very good. Yeah, agreed. It's, I mean, obviously fresh like everything else. The uni, I'll, I'll say I like uni, but I know I know not everybody does. I know that's it's a bit of a kind of a different flavor, different texture, but I think even if you're someone who doesn't love uni, like, that the way it combines with that dish is just so good between the like, the freshness of the yellowtail, a little bit like, again, citrus, um, and then the uni just kind of adds some creaminess and like, a little bit of light sweetness to it. It's a really excellent combo. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, definitely I would say it's probably I mean, one of the best unis I've had in recent memory. Just... Interesting. Great texture, great flavor. There's sometimes you get uni with bad aftertaste, mm-hmm. ocean aftertaste. Mm-hmm. This one is just perfectly clear. It's like a fresh mountain spring, but uni. Now the next one is is another tostada uh, dish that we were given, um, but in a, again a different uh, preparation, and that is uh, tostada de pat, uh, pate con cayo, and uh, this is a conpachi head pate. Um, Hokkaido scallops with chili oil, chives, and on the uh, tostada raspada that we saw, um, you know, earlier. So um, this was a, I think, a different masa, a blue masa in this case, as we can see here, um, but layered again with the pate and and the scallops. I think we took uh, very nicely to this. I think we're all very uh, quite impressed. Um, but yeah, this was uh, this was a good bite. What do you think, guys? I mean, I feel like we should just emphasize for point that that, that pate, it's kampachi head. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, they were very, they're, they're a very eco-conscious restaurant, and they're very much aware of, you know, how to be sustainable and how to use all their ingredients. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever been in a restaurant that's like, oh, yeah, we grinded up our fish head and, like, made pate out of it. Like, that was, that was new, but I see. this was phenomenally delicious. So, yeah. like... Totally, totally works. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The what, the only yeah. the only knock I have about this dish is while he was preparing it, he put like all the scallops on one plate, and I really thought I was about to get a plate of twelve yeah. scallops. Same, so, same so getting getting downsized to this was a little disappointing, but that's that's really my only complaint. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted a whole that plate, was an whole plate of pate and scallops. Uh, wouldn't be a bad thing. Yeah, definitely an adjustment period <laughs> when you come to terms with what's put in front of you. <laughs> you have to accept. Uh, yeah, I mean, not to spoil the rest of this uh, podcast, I'm at least a recollection of this meal, but this is my worth it winner from oh. the the entire meal. Mm-hmm. The meal mm-hmm. was my favorite item. Um, yeah. And yes, it was a blue corn uh, tostada. So similar preparation, just with a different type of corn. Uh, but everything just... Everything just worked so well together. It just it just sang. Delicious. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah. the scallops were super fresh. Again, I keep saying this, and maybe it's because I just haven't had fresh scallops and I haven't had uni in a long time, but this is the, probably the best scallop I've had in recent memory. Okay. Well, uh, Chef yeah, is I really mean, bringing uh, up his game, so... Yeah, the sauce also on it, like, complements it perfectly. Like, it was a little bit spicy, but, like, a little bit, a little bit oily, yeah. a little bit, like, it, it totally worked and yeah and I, I guess for for anyone who maybe i didn't make it clear enough for anyone who's listening is like fish head like he says it's good but you know fish head sounds very fishy like no it's actually not that seafoody flavor like it's it's definitely more pate than fish head mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah they they must have a you know their own uh, technique of of making it i mean the way it is just that good um can you guys remind me what exactly like what pate is usually made out of i i, I actually don't quite know um, 
usually duck liver or liver. Oh, I see. Uh, I, see. I think I'm trying to remember for Vietnamese sandwiches, they also have pate in there. That's right. But I think mm-hmm. that's chicken liver, maybe. Don't quote oh. me. I'm not a foodie. I have not been to 90 plus establishments in the last however many podcasts. Okay. I think, yeah, I think liver is the common one. It's, or, you know, like, I think you could also do like a ground up, um, you know, like pork or something. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think liver is the most common. Okay. Yeah. Well, from a goat house or goat liver moose. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's basically a pate. Mm-hmm. Got it. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so, uh, probably we could probably start from there since we agree that that was like the best. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, the rest of but, it was forgettable. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Damn. I'm kidding. So we're we're about halfway through, uh, maybe a little halfway through. So the next uh, dish from this menu was the uh, chochoyotes, which basically is like, um, as it says, uh, basically like masa dumplings. So we have um, some mussels here, um, uh, Hope Ranch mussels with the, the blue corn chochoyotes. A chili atole rojo and uh, almond uh, pibion, which is like the sauce there. So, um, yeah, this this was a uh, again just another nice thoughtful you know bite. That sauce is, I think the way he described it was not quite soup, not quite sauce. It's like some some texture you know in between. Um, uh, but yeah, what what did you guys think of this? Transition from cold items to now hot prepared items. That's sort of right. The mm-hmm. first before, um, I thought it was nice. It's I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm repeating myself. Just nice balance of flavors. Um, the the blue corn uh, dumpling. I think he said this was the stuff that they had scraped off, or was this the next dish? Well, I know they're not wasting it, so it probably could have been the stuff that they scraped off. From the, the mm-hmm, preparation mm-hmm. of tostada was f- used to form these dumplings was accompanied with these mussels and you kind of just ate them all together with this pipian sauce and it was really nice uh the blue corn masa had a nice savory sweetness to it it was not i say sweetness lightly um it definitely was not sweet by any means but it had that that slight mm-hmm. hint of sweetness that helped balance everything out but it was tasty never had anything quite like it before yeah yeah, definitely my first like Mexican dumpling I've had, but I I need more. Yeah, I would definitely get more. It's an open faced dumpling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and deconstructed. And deconstructed. Yeah. Uh okay. So it looks like, yeah, there's just again kind of this joining of different types of techniques and a little bit of culture intersection here with uh, some of these dishes, especially with with this next one, although we can say that the tostada, you know, with the pate is probably one of the favorites. This next one is probably also one of the more unique ones, to be honest. And that's the uh, tamal de uh, abulon, uh, the abalone uh, tamale, basically. So um, it's abalone with uh, uh, the masa uh, colada and the liver sauce. So um, I think, John, to what you were saying earlier, I think they were... This is probably what they were using, right? They they were using the uh, the scraped off uh, masa from the raspada, and uh, they were using it for for this dish, I think. Yeah, yeah. This one definitely was from the uh, tuna raspada, uh, the the yellow corn masa they had scraped off, and they shucked these uh, abalones and filled their shells with this uh, this masa mixture. And then the chef had mentioned that the abalone, the perfect temperature to cook them for, for him, was the 12-minute mark. And so Mm -hmm. he was trying to figure out how to cook them delicately without overcooking them. So they landed on on, uh, steaming them. And actually, you can kind of get a sense of it from this photo. But underneath that entire dish is a banana leaf, I think it was. And when they took them out to prepare them for us, they're actually all wrapped up like little tamales or even like Chinese dump or Chinese uh, tamales. Um, they came out in these little packets of banana leaves and he had to unfold every single one of them and remove uh, the contents, which was the abalone shell, the masa and the abalone itself. So they steamed that whole contraption for 12 minutes. And this was a very pleasant surprise for me. I really enjoyed this dish. Uh, the, the masa after that steam bath that it sits in was nice and fluffy, great flavor, and then just the abalone was cooked to perfection. Yeah, I 
I'm usually not a big Avalon fan, which I know that's that's sacrilege. I know it's a delicacy. Every time my in-laws come to visit, that's like the main thing. They're like, okay, you know, we'll make dinner and then we'll we'll make Avalon. You know, it's time to celebrate. And I was like, all right, that's that's fine. You know, like <laughs> everyone else likes it. You know, I, I should eat some too. But this I was like, it's like, oh damn, it's really really good. Um, yeah, this made you uh, look forward to. Uh... Yes. More yeah. Totally. Totally changed my opinion of what Avalon could be. Um, the texture between a the masa is, you know, it like works out as John was saying. It works out to be the exact right amount of time to cook, right consistency. Um, the abalone itself, sometimes I feel like, and you know, maybe a lot of other people like this, but abalone can be a little bit uh, kind of rubbery, a little bit hard to eat. Mm, yeah. But the way this was cooked, it like. It was a little bit softer, but not so soft that it kind of blended into the masa. Like it was still a very distinct texture from the masa, and then the flavor itself, like the flavor was still out but then it just blended so well, and it was it was excellent. Totally. Um, yeah, John, I I don't know if you uh, if you recall. Actually, I don't know in in what other context. Uh, but you remember we had that uh, we tried abalone at uh, at Bistro 1968. Uh, they had that that balloon there. Obviously, not in the same you know level or or context or whatever. But uh, I think those were one of the few times we've uh, able to appreciate um, the use of abalone. But this one definitely took it to a a different level. So yeah, it's not a seafood that I particularly would seek out. And Daniel and I share the same in laws, so I've had the same abalone and. <laughs> Yeah, this is not something that I'm chasing, so it was a very pleasant surprise having it here. I can't even remember the last time I had abalone besides 1986 yeah. or 60 or whatever that place is called. Right. Let's petition to uh, to chef to um, to bring this on the regular menu, and um, and then we'll enjoy it from there. Or or at least uh, whenever we if ever we go to another tasting menu to uh, just include that there again. Um, so, all right. So, um, we're nearly, we're nearly through here, but we've got a few more to get through. The next one is, uh, is, a, is one of the few tacos, uh, that we've had on this tasting menu. Surprise, surprise. Um, but this next one is the, uh, taco de jaiba, which is, uh, a Dungeness crab with, uh, the smoked, uh, yellow tail with the uh, Oaxaca cheese and a crab butter salsa matcha. So, um, this was uh, kind of a, you know, for crab uh, and, and everything, it was a pretty rich uh, kind of uh, uh, dish with everything on there. The salsa, matcha with the cheese, you know, you can see kind of that cheese crust, uh, cheese skirt there uh, on the uh, on the tortilla. Um, but yeah, it was uh, for being a crab, uh, for being a taco, um, I think as the chef suggested that uh, you do need a fork and a knife to, uh, to get through this. Um, so, but you know, uh, it, it it didn't last too long. Let's put it that way. Not yet. This one's definitely not taco to be eaten with hands. But um, yeah, like you said, the crab in there was was filling. Like you could taste it. It was very crab heavy taco, but made it quite delicious. Um, I think was it to me. This might be one of the like weaker parts of the meal and that's but that's like in context it's like there were so many a plus dishes and like a dishes this one was maybe a minus like it's still still really good but it just didn't mm -hmm. quite have the same flair that some of the other ones did mm, okay but it was like that that's that's all within the context of not not to spoil the ending like every single dish was amazing and this was the only one that was like great instead of amazing I see. I see. Um, I will say the fun doesn't do it justice in the sense that once you cut into this taco, it's literally just a brick of crab. <laughs> and I've never had so much. Well, I've never had a crab taco, let alone a solid chunk of crab in there. I think the last time I had that much crab in any dish was in Thailand at J5 when we had their crab omelet. Uh -huh. um, and the way she had prepared that was just. It was literally the main ingredient crab, add some eggs for flavor and color, but and buy things. <laughs> Otherwise, it was just all crab. Um, yeah. I enjoyed this dish a lot, but I think it's because also I'm very partial to crab. Um, and I think it was a Dungeness crab, which is something my parents yeah. would make every so often growing up. So I had a bit of an affinity for it. I know how much 
work it is to go through and pick out all that crab to get into that taco. Um, yeah. It definitely wasn't the most flavorful of everything that we had, but um, to me, it was unique in that I just never had a, a crab based taco before. So mm. it was a fun surprise. Um, and then, yeah, I had to use a fork and knife because it is a bit of a mess to, to work your way through. But like Dan said, like it's maybe not the strongest of everything here, but that's again, in the context of just everything here, which everything was phenomenal. Okay. All right. Good. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about this last dish then. Uh, this one is, uh, the uh, camarones a la taya. That's uh, your grilled uh, Santa Barbara prawns with uh, salsa verde and a cucumber salad. So um, I I remember enjoying this. Uh, I I don't remember. We This was not, I think we had asked partway through, this was not uh, shrimp to be eaten whole, right? I think we had to leave the shell or something. Yes, you were supposed to. They, they had the... the was it the peel or like the shell was on and you were supposed to peel it, which I, I, I had eaten the first one before somebody asked that question, but you know, I'll say the, the shell was, was still pretty flavorful. So not, not the worst mistake to make. Yeah. Um, so in, you know, you eat the, the shrimp, the body, including the contents of the head. I, I don't know. Uh, just want to make sure. Do we, uh, are we on board with that? Um, with the uh, shrimp head contents as well? In this case, yes. Okay. Are there cases where that's uh, averted? Yes. In what cases? Any any Chinese buffet that serves a whole shrimp in this fashion, I would advise against <laughs> eating the head. Okay. It seems like a pretty good life, life lesson to follow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I think at this point of the meal, I was just so full. I can barely remember what was going on. Wow, I was so full. I could not remember what was going on. I don't know. I I don't have. I don't have too many recollections about this. It was tasty, is all I remember. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, I thought. um, mm -hmm. I thought the grill kind of flavor on it was was excellent. Um. Yeah, the fish head. The fish head actually was good. Like to John's point, sometimes you have the fish head and you're just like. I just had salt water like this. You do not have that. You do not have that feeling at all with this one. You're like, oh yeah, like more shrimp flavor. Great. Um, yeah, totally. And then also like the little cucumber salad was really nice with it too. Um, mm-hmm. I've kind of played off it well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not pictured good. is the skewer that they were uh, that was pushed through the entire length of the shrimp. Uh, one to kill the shrimp, and then two to help keep it uh, keep it straight when it was being grilled. Did they, and then um, part of the prep process was removing the skewer and then getting the salad on top of it. I see. Did they show that while they were preparing mm-hmm. it? I guess I missed that. Okay. I mean, they didn't show the prep side of it where they killed uh-huh. the shrimp. They showed the post-killing side of it. So with, it with came the skewer. Out the, the, yeah. With the skewer, right, still attached. And then they, were, they had to go through each one of them. And the chef and actually one of the sous chef tag team, that there was just so many of the shrimps to get through. Interesting. So Interesting. They had to work together to remove all the skewers and then get it plated. Okay. Nice. Um, so we're technically done with uh, with the tasting menu, but um, what is you know a menu, a full menu, and, and meal without some dessert? And I remember when um, when this was brought out, it wasn't talked about or explained or anything. But I do remember that Daniel was quite excited when uh, uh, when this I was. Felt like they read us. my mind when they brought this out. It was. I so. <laughs> it was like it was like the the whole meal was amazing. I was like, man, they they're like. They just know exactly what what I want, what I want to eat. And then when this one came out, it was like, yeah, this is confirmed. Like they have they have hacked into my brain, and they're just like triggering all the things that make me happy. <laughs> Let's release all the endorphins here. Um, in this case, we're talking about some churros uh, with some chocolate sauce as well. Um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, you know with all the the nice savory things that we've enjoyed it's nice to have uh some sweet to to round it out so um you know i i don't know i i enjoyed these i i noticed uh you know it was a nice crunchy you know outside cinnamony and everything but definitely i think we had some observation that the uh the inside was definitely more wet uh definitely more of a wet uh, uh batter in there um but i think still overall pretty good um again with the chocolate sauce uh it's not it's not as terribly sweet chocolate it's like a darker chocolate so uh it's not too powerful 
um, in sweetness. But um, I, I think it's a nice addition to to have. So, what do you guys think? You guys agree? That's that's pretty much right on. Like, oh, I'll, I'll say you know, for anyone going to Mexico City, like I think their churros are are more fried, which turned out to be yeah. better to my taste. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, like, what a the the exact right finisher to the meal. You know, you have some fantastic entree, seafood, etc., and then boom, churro. That's that's all you need. Nice. And the unique thing about this churro that not that I'm a churro connoisseur by any means, so don't take this as some kind of wisdom, but this is the only churro I've ever had where the center of it was hollowed out the entire way through. Oh, right. So that mm-hmm. directly, if you wanted to use it as a straw, you could. It's mm-hmm. not like it's completely hollowed out, but it's a narrow opening mm-hmm. that yeah. sends through the entire thing. Some and I don't know if that's maybe. maybe. Huh. And not have the presence of mind to do that. If, but yeah, maybe. if you if you haven't already, you know, drunken through the whole, you know, thing there, then yeah. I guess. Uh, if you didn't take the shot yet, uh, fair. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Ooh, nice. Curious. Good. Yeah, that's right. Good. Good observation. Um, so yeah, that that uh, kind of wraps up the the tasting uh, menu at uh, at Holbosch, and. Um, Let's kind of uh, we we've kind of alluded to a number of things already, but let's um, get your thoughts on maybe yeah the memorable one. Let's say top three here. Uh, what would you say would be uh, three memorable um, you know dishes Ooh. from here? Ooh. So tricky. Um, I think I think the two that I have to include for sure are scallop tostada. And the abalone tamale. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The abalone tamale may not be, you know, that I might have liked other dishes more if I think about it, but just for the uniqueness and the surprise and the fun of it, like that that one gets in there. Um, number three, there's there's a lot of the the kind of more like sashimi and tostada dishes at the start that we looked at. Um, all like, you know, there's there's a lot of dishes that could go in there. At number three for me, um, I'll probably pick. The tuna tostada, just because I, I, you know, I've got a thing for those. But like mm-hmm. either the the rock vermilion sashimi or the yellowtail with the uni, like those, those all could be good choices. Okay, what about you, John? Yeah, I would say my top three also all incorporate masa and tostada into it. So number mm-hmm. one will be the uh, the scallop tostada as I've already alluded to. The second one, same as Daniel, would be the abalone. Mm-hmm. Um, something about that masa when it's steamed, it's just so light and fluffy. Like It looks like a tamale, so you kind of expect the tamale texture of the masa, yeah. but uh, it was just it was just very unique and a very nice pairing to the abalone. Um, and then the third masa incorporated item on my list would be the same as Daniel, that tuna tostada. I think I'm still riding the high from Mexico City, so I was just excited mm. to see a tuna tostada. So maybe there's a little bit of a bias there, uh, yeah. but just knowing the care and energy that required to make that tostada coupled with a super fresh fish um, was hard to beat. Yeah, agreed. Um, I'm probably up there with you. Yeah, definitely have to put the, um, uh, the scallop tostada on there, uh, the, the tamal, the um, abalone, and um if i had a third i'd probably actually go with um uh with the crab uh either between the crab or the other crudo um uh, the crab because like you said john you know it's just such a uh a dense you know uh presentation dense offering of uh, a crab you know uh in in a small package um and either that or the or the crudo only because it's just a nice simple fresh um, you know, dish there, but, um, uh, those were, those were definitely memorable. Uh, let me get your thoughts. I think maybe you talked a little bit about, um, what, how, if you can, can you draw, you know, uh, similarities between this and, uh, Contramar if, if possible, um, what, what do you guys have to say about that? Yeah, I think there's definitely some similarities. I mean, they're both, you know, kind of a, a Mexican seafood. Um, I think compared to, I think Contramar, obviously, bigger operation, um, you know, less intimate, less, you know, it's not, 
you know, not a full tasting menu. So there's, there's differences in just like how, how the restaurant approach, or just in terms of the, the flavor of the food, um, there's similar flavors for my, I mean, this whole, this whole Bosch tasting menus, not cheap, cheap, but it's, you know, relative to some other tasting menus, it's, it's a pretty, it's a very good value. Actually. I think, it, I think it's actually an amazing value. Um, but I, I think, so I, I think the food you're getting at whole Bosch is probably a bit better than what you're getting at Contramar. Um, higher price point though. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, if I recall the, uh, the price per person, you know, all inclusive, probably about one thirty or something for, uh, for this tasting menu. So, um, you could definitely get, you can el- definitely go elsewhere, um, for more. Um, but yeah, I think, I think overall, again, the, the takeaway is, you know, given, um, you know, where, where it's, where it's at, you know, it's situated, it's space. Um, and then given the food and the quality that they're serving, they definitely, you can definitely, um, if you didn't know, if you had just gone to the restaurant itself, I feel like you definitely could have taken away that it was more, could be a, a higher end restaurant, um, you know, and, uh, serving a higher quality, um, you know, foods and dishes and things. Um, I mean, you know, if we like these dishes, uh, as I said, um, uh, you definitely will want to go back and try the regular menu items. They have a lot of, um, you know, whether it's the tacos or the ceviche, um, uh, they have, you know, a great uh, offering of a uh, pulpo, you know, or octopus. Um, but I think uh, just like this, uh, you know, this here, you'll anything you probably get from uh, the regular menu will will um, probably be a hit as well. So. Um, so when are we going is the question, really? I mean, I'd go very soon. I mean, I, I don't know if you're going to ask this, Angelo, but like, yeah, I mean, this overall, this meal is probably, you know, I'm, I'm trying to replay meals from like the last year in my head, but like, this may be like the best meal I've had in the last year, at least like this Amazing. was mm-hmm. consistently like every single dish was, like I said, amazing. The old you know, for me, at least there was one dish, which was great, but I mean, that's still like, that's still an amazing bar to hit. Um, yeah. yeah. And again, at, you know, yeah, 130 is a person's definitely not cheap, but in LA that you could end up spending a lot more, I think. Um, so yeah, this is definitely a, a, a meal of the year for me. Like all, all mm-hmm. the hype associated with all is, is met. Yeah. And more. Yeah, I think kind of going back to your original question about comparing Contramar versus Hobosh, um, I kind of think of Contramar. For me, it's hard to make the comparison because um, I think of Contramar more like a you know a restaurant with cloud, crowd pleasers uh, dishes. So things that you may find elsewhere, it's just maybe fresh ingredients or slight difference in the preparation. Whereas uh, Hobosh was very much a, a very inventive, experimental, fun, right. playful menu. Right. Uh, but with that said, like Daniel had said, everything just knocked it out of the park and everything was super tasty. There wasn't anything that was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I could do without this dish here. So certainly would recommend trying the tasty menu. It's not cheap, but at the same time, you could also do much worse in LA and maybe not necessarily get the same satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I would say about uh, the Contra Mar, or sorry, about uh, Hobo is that you know, if you're sitting there, going through the tasting menu, the chefs are also preparing their regular menu items in front of you. Uh, maybe not necessarily for you, but you can watch them bring it all together and everything else looks just as delicious. Um, looks very fun, uh, very vibrant. Like the colors. Everything looks really fresh as well. Uh, so a really popular item was this giant ceviche dish. Seems yeah. like every other minute the guy was making a new ceviche dish. Um, and that looked really tasty. If I had more room in the tank, I definitely would have tried something else off their a la carte menu, but I, I was already tapped out by dish eight of nine. Uh, but yeah, overall, phenomenal experience. Highly recommend. Uh, much fun, inventive ways to eat seafood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a special uh, place. Uh, lucky for LA to have a, you know, a restaurant like this to showcase um you know high quality thoughtful food and service and you know at a great value and in 
you know, pocket of LA that um, some people know, but not necessarily everyone would go out to. So maybe it, it just takes a little bit of uh, adventure to uh, to get out there. So hopefully we can um, find time to, to go out there again and try um, the regular menu and just um, be wowed just all the same. And uh, Mindshow, of course, you're gonna you're gonna come along with us as well, and uh, we are going to cause massive uh, <laughs> to the species of the sea there. So, what do you think? Yeah, I want that uh, brick of crab. <laughs> we'll have to see if uh, Chef can uh, can make that uh, a part of the regular menu as well, or at least a special order for us uh, when we <laughs> go out there. But it's I just wanted to say also that you know it's nice to see restaurants where um you know the chef you know and the owner is uh you know is out there you know with the people and um you know he's talking he's interacting um whether just there at least in a um you know just kind of uh just interacting with the guests or in this case just actually also preparing the food and you know being involved directly in um uh in in the preparation and and serving of the food so um you know, all too sometimes too often you might find some restaurants that you know when they have that uh, that clout, that that reputation, or or they reach a certain point, um, you know, they're the chefs and and everything. They can be uh, they can be in any sort of place. You know, sometimes taken away from uh, you know from the from the restaurant or the space to do other things. Um, but it's just nice to see when uh, when they are there. So really appreciate that, and really hope to look forward to more good meals there um but yeah thanks guys for you know for joining us and uh thanks for for sharing your thoughts on that uh this was definitely something i was uh really looking forward to and finally got to kind of get down and um kind of discuss so hopefully we get you out here again uh next time i don't know run that's good that's a good cue (laughs) <laughs> but anyway, with that said, we've come to the end of another episode. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our few and only fans for joining us. We're excited to bring you more of our adventures with good food and good people. Just reach out. We're on Instagram. I'm at Dumb and Hungry. He is at my underscore chow. Why don't you just slide right in there? You can also email us at hi at dumbandhungry.com where you can leave us our feedback and your love letters. You can also find the videos on YouTube. Won't you like, subscribe, and smash? You can also find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else fine podcasts are served. But until next time, I'm Angelo, the Dumb and Hungry. I'm Matt Chow. John. Daniel, no social media. Nice. And on your next food adventure, remember to try one of each.